Welcome to Secrets of the Art Business Podcast. Practical tools, insightful conversation for the curious art professionals. I'm Daniela Dupin, your host for season one. I'm the founder of the Blonder Dealer blog and also an art professional for the past 15 years. I met some really interesting artists, curators, collectors, and professionals that I hope will give you some great insights into the art business. And why not? We're gonna find some great secrets. So join us for the conversation and for this incredible journey. Welcome to episode four of Secrets of the Art Business. Today with me as a guest is Finn Jennings. And I'm your host, Daniela Dupin of the Blonde Art Dealer blog. And I'm here today to talk with Finn about the importance of online presence for artists. So Finn, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. And it's a pleasure to have you here today. Oh, thanks for having me. It's fantastic to, to be able to come and talk about artists representing themselves online. Perfect. So um, I also want to introduce you and um, tell our listener a bit more about you. Um, you're a writer and curator at Rise Art. Rise Art is an online um, gallery and platform for emerging um, mid-career, but also a few established artists. Um, and it started over 10 years ago um, in London and really evolved through the years. Um, it's really interesting that um, you know online galleries nowadays are having such a you know huge moment because of the lack of physical spaces. But what we're going to talk about today is really the importance for artists to be seen and noticed online. And you come in as a curator, um, you really bring that eye and experience, which is invaluable for artists to get noticed and be seen in the um, in the market today. And apart from, of course, your incredible taste and your um, you know, keen eye, I wanted to really get into um, the tools that artists really need to use um, to be noticed in the online. And of course, nowadays, we know the importance of platforms like Instagram, but also let's not forget about the basics of an artist's websites or their CV and et cetera. So I wanted you to reflect on that uh, from your experience um, as a curator. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the first thing to say is in the, in the art world for emerging artists, there's so much saturation that who stumbles upon your work is almost always going to be a matter of luck to some degree. And whether they find you through looking at who their friends are following on Instagram or who an artist or curator they like is following on Instagram or you know, your, your work comes up on their explore page, or they see you in a show, or someone tells you about them. I think the way that someone stumbles across your work and the reasons why they might say yes, i.e. they stumble across it and they like it, is always really gonna be a matter of luck, or if not luck, something that's kind of somewhat out of your hands. I think what is in your hands is giving them as few reasons as possible to say no. And so for me, those things are, I guess, I suppose it comes down to having a, an online presence that's sloppy in some way, so having you know, platforms, uh, a presence on platforms that you haven't updated for years mm -hmm. or having, you know, a website that is really not user friendly or has broken links and things like that. And I think the, the first thing I would say to any artist who wants to represent themselves online is just try and look at it through the prism of giving those people who might be offering you an opportunity or trying to buy your work or wanting to show your work, give them as few reasons as possible to say no. And even if that means doing less and giving them fewer reasons to say yes, for example, you know, having a bunch of different social medias and being across, you know, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, everything. Um, if you're not, if that turns into a reason for them to say no, if it's, you know, not updated properly or it, it just doesn't look credible, then you may as well not have it. So I think it's, it's about being light touch and just making sure that everything you do, you're doing well and you're doing in a way that, yeah, is credible and, and, and makes the person think that you're engaged with what you're doing and mm -hmm. they should take your work seriously and your practice seriously because you're taking it seriously. And let's go back to, of course, these are all great valid points. Um, let's go back to the basics. Like, let's say you discover an artist that you like and um, if you look at their website, you go into their website, um, what are the things that really come to your mind immediately when I look at the website? What's the first thing that you look at? Is it the artist statement? Is it the CV? And what are the things within 
you know, the CV or the statement that really stand out for you? I think for me, um, in a professional capacity, I'm normally drawn to the CV just because I think that although it's not exhaustive, it can give you something of a something of an idea of how serious the artist is or where they kind of in what part of the art world they exist to some degree. And it's, it's only ever going to be an indicator. And you can always override that by looking at other things like their work and their statement mm -hmm. and decide they're not best represented by their CV. But I always go straight for the CV and then look at a portfolio or their artist statement. I think with all these things, simplicity is key. And I've never yet been, and I'm waiting to be proved wrong, I've never been on an artist's website and thought this is too simple and it's turned me off. I've always thought there's too much noise, this is too complicated. Mm -hmm. And if it's simple, and I'm talking about a white page, some pictures of your work and a few links across the top, I think that's just right. Um, to go into a bit more granular detail, I think for an artist's CV, um, it should basically just be uh, you know, a, sh a, short, a short biography made up of the kind of objective facts of your, um, of your existence as an artist. So, you know, I like to see at the top um, where you were born, where you work, maybe your birth year, but, you know, those th if you're not comfortable sharing that information, you know, you don't have to. And I have had artists in the past who don't want don't to say where they were born or how old they are because they feel like it will change people's views. And I think mm -hmm. that's fair enough. Um, and then just the selected, selected solo shows, selected group shows. If you've got hundreds, don't put them all on there. Just, you know, selected is the key word. So just the ones that are going to impress people, perhaps. Um, and then the collections you're in, anything like um, awards or residencies. And then if you have one, it's fantastic to see a bibliography. And I like it when a bibliography, and that can be text that you've written, um, as long as they link to your practice in some way or your existence as an artist or text written about you. What I love is a bibliography with hyperlinks so I can just click yes. and open a bunch <laughs> of new tabs and read all about you from someone else's um, point of view. And then the other thing is an artist statement I think is important to get right. I think it should be um, written in very plain English. Um, it should be short as possible, you know, 50, 100 words I think is good. Um, and it should be about why other people should care about your work. And I think that's so hard to do as an artist because you spend, you know, X number of hours a day, X number of days a week in the studio working. And you're so inside the world of your work and the concepts you deal with and the ideas you're thinking about that it can be difficult to see the wood from the trees and you can write why you care about your work, but it doesn't necessarily communicate why it might be important in the wider world. So I'd recommend reading out to as many people as you can and just making sure it's something that people can understand and something that's really captivating and doesn't, you don't need to go too deep into the ideas that you're having. I think it's more about, um, you know, giving someone a reason to walk away from reading it and thinking, I want to see some pictures of this or I want to go and take a look at their exhibition. This sounds interesting. Yeah, because I mean, in terms of the artist statement, then these can be then um, read by not only curators like you, but also, you know, people like me, like art advisors to really understand the artist, collectors as well, who want to understand a bit more about, you know, who you are as an artist. And then it can also be used by the press, like it can be used in a press release or in an article if they're doing an interview about your work. And so I think, yeah, the artist statement, it's hard to conceive because it's a really a syn synthesis of who you are in few words. Um, do you think they should write it themselves, the artist, or maybe get someone else to write it? Um, I think it should be written in the third person. So I think it should be written with, you know, um, your name does X, Y, and Z, and it means mm -hmm. A, B, and C. But I think that you can write it yourself if you feel confident doing so. I just think you should show it to as many people as possible. And if you want to have someone else write it from an outsider's perspective, or just have some of your, you know, friends, colleagues, people you're studying with, you know, write what they think your work's about and try and, you know, collate that. I think it's a short piece of text, but you can spend a lot of time on it because it's really, like you said, it's really where people are going to go to find out about your work. And, you know, a lot of time it's where journalists are going to go to read about you. And you just, again, you want to give them few, as few reasons as possible to say no, because I've certainly seen artists I've wanted to write about. I've been on maybe as part of an article featuring a number of artists working in a certain medium or with certain themes. And I've seen that artist statement and I thought this is going to take me 15 minutes to decode and mm -hmm. I've got four hours to write this article. I'm just going to choose someone else. You know, I think for journalists, sometimes it's nice to give them something they can just copy and paste or something they can understand really easily. And that's not to say that your practice needs to be really simple. I just think you need to be able to explain it in simple terms. And if the idea is truly a captivating one, then you will be able to explain it in a way that anyone can understand. I mean, there's a saying um, that I read that if you can explain it, you know, with simple words, 
then you should not talk about it. Yeah, 100%. and so that that's a good way to to go about Absolutely. it. Absolutely, I think there's a there's a there's a really good text about um, writing about politics by George Orwell called Politics in the English Language. It's really short and it's available online. I'd really recommend reading that. And he just says everything you're reading, everything you're writing, read it back. And if there's a single word that isn't in service of what you're trying to say, then get rid of it. It needs to be very very simple i think i can't stress that enough <laughs> <laughs> um let's you know let's move out from the text and let's go back into the power of images mm -hmm. so one of the question i had is um where you know do you find the artists like on instagram or do you go to like degree shows of course now because of the year we've just been degree shows you know they've been taken online so it's again a different format so tell us a bit more about where you really discover, you know, the next, you know, new talents, the artist. I think um, in the last year, it's been almost all Instagram and a few online degree shows. Um, in terms of the way I do it on Instagram, it's generally, you know, there are kind of, um, and I'm sure you find this in the world of emerging artists, little pockets of communities. And they normally exist either around art schools or around certain studios and things like that. And they're all friends and they all organize shows together. And I think it's really easy just if you give yourself the time to get in a hole and just open a bunch of new people's pages in a new tab and kind of go through. And this is when I mean, it's really important not to give people a reason to say no, because mm -hmm. you, when you're working on your website and your Instagram, you're working single-mindedly on your website, your Instagram, and you're spending the time looking at them. Whereas when someone's looking at your, when someone else is looking at your website and your Instagram, a lot of the time they might have 25 tabs open with different artists and it's really easy for them to just move their mouse to the cross and press it if they see something that turns, it's like um, Britain's Got Talent, um, <laughs> you know, press the cross if they see something that, 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 that turns them off. Um, and so that's one way I do it is, is, is by kind of, you know, following leads through these artist communities and seeing who's shown with who on Instagram um, in terms of, and this is more in terms of kind of emerging artists who aren't gallery represented because they're, kind of the bread and butter of who we work with at Rise Art. And then online degree shows, I found are actually really helpful because when you go to a, a real life degree show, you pick up the card from the card holder mm -hmm. and then you have to go home and kind of remember who's who and hopefully their business card's got something that relates to their work on it. So you can think, oh yeah, they're the person who did, you know, the oil paintings of whatever. Um, whereas now you can just, again, op open their Instagram in a new tab and send them a DM straight away saying, hey, I loved your work at your degree show and then open a conversation that way. So I think, Although um, degree shows in person, it's much, you know, much more of a full experience of the artwork and, and the artist, and you might get to meet them in person if you're lucky, um, if, they're, if they're hanging around. Um, degree shows online do have their own merits, and I think I've probably had more conversations from artists graduating in the last year than any year before, just because it is easy to, <laughs> just because it is easy to, um, because it is easy to start that conversation straight away on, online. Well, that sounds great because, I know that artists have been affected so much uh, from the degree show and they almost feel that from their point of view, I heard that they feel, you know, there's less opportunities because mm -hmm. of the lack of personal contact. But it's great to hear from your point of view that actually that's not the case. Um, so let's talk, let's go back to Instagram. And, you know, when you look at an Instagram page of an artist and you look at the images like what's really striking for you because I know some artists really struggle with um, relating powerful images of their work um, and maybe also building stories mm -hmm. and um, narrative around their work and we know that storytelling for artists is key nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah for sure and I think as an artist using your Instagram page it's difficult to do it in a way that remains authentic whilst kind of keeping it in mind because you don't want to well in my view i don't think an artist wants to end up being an online instagram personality and i think the, the artist and the influencer on social media you know should do different things that being said i think if you're an artist and you're genuinely passionate about what you do you know you're maybe part of a community of like-minded people practitioners of kind of similar types of things i think it should come naturally and i think you know um don't underestimate how interesting what you're doing is as an artist. And if you're in the studio mixing colors, or if you're listening to a certain record that's inspiring you, or if you see something on the street that you know, reminds you of some of the themes you deal with or makes you think about, makes you want to make art, um, I think you should you know, post it. And I think my favorite, my favorite artist Instagram pages 
are ones that give me a little view, not only of their work, but in some capacity, like the inside of their own brain and, you know, what it is they're seeing that's inspiring them, who it is they're seeing that's mm -hmm. inspiring them. And that doesn't have to be art. It, it can be art. And I love um, a really good, ex a really good example is um, Sean Stedman is an abstract painter and he just posts like throughout the last thousands of years of art history, loads of great images and his Instagram page is like an image bank and maybe 10% of the works are his and 90% are by everyone from kind of contemporary artists to ancient, you know, cave art mm -hmm. and things like that. So it can be art you're posting, but it can be anything that inspires you and, you know, whether that's music or things you see out on the street or fashion or I think or archive imagery. I think all of those things are super interesting and for a collector or a curator or anyone who wants to kind of deepen their engagement with your practice, that's another way that they can do that through kind of looking at the associated objects and images and Instagram's a fantastic place to do that. I found the same actually from my point of view, you know, being an art advisor and trying to provide inspiring content of things that I like on Instagram. Of course now you can go and see shows and you can to some degree, you know, create inspiration from online sources. But really, it's about you, things that in the everyday really inspire you. And it doesn't have to be like things that you see physically. But as you said, you know, the surrounding of it or, yeah. or what other people find also interesting. So it's about creating that story, that context that is so personal. And as long as you tell it with authenticity, um, mm -hmm. then it's really something that people can relate to. Yeah. Um, and they can quickly understand if you're just doing it because you have to do it every day. So yeah. one thing that I say to artists is don't post every day just because you have to, because there's this algorithm that everyone talks about, but actually changes all the time. So do it because you feel like you want to share something and it has a meaning. Yeah, definitely. And I think the thing is about Instagram in general is a lot of people are very jaded by it because the idea is that you're posting all this stuff, who cares, no one cares. I think for artists, the opposite is sometimes true. And you know, you go to an artist's studio and you see all the, you know, just like interesting things they have around an ephemera and things pinned up on notice board. And I always start taking pictures of them and they're like, who cares about this? I thought you came to see the paintings, but really as an artist, you shouldn't underestimate the fact that if someone's spending time on your Instagram and if they want to engage with your work, they do care about all of those things. And it's interesting to someone. Um, even if it's just boring and every day to you because, you know, you're an artist and it's loads of fun and really interesting. The people, you know, who are following your work um, want to see that to some degree. Definitely. And let's also go back to the other basics. So the artist portfolios. You must receive, apart from like the way you go and look online, you also must receive a lot of um, artist applications. Um, do you have a, um, also on Rise Art a prize? Um, we do have a prize, yeah. We, um, we, it was going to be in 2020, but it wasn't. So it's um, being pushed back, but we, we do have a prize. Yeah. So you must receive a lot of application. Mm -hmm. When you receive this application, you receive portfolios. Yeah. Can you... Um, talk about portfolios and what are you know the good things that you see in portfolios for sure and at risk of sounding like a broken record it's all <laughs> about keeping it simple doing it right i think that i mean i you're, you're going to think i don't need to say this but i really do if they ask for a pdf send them a pdf <laughs> you know if they ask for you know x number of images send them that number of images if they don't ask for a certain number of images i'd say kind of 10 to 15 try and represent the the breadth of your practice so if you you know use multiple media or work with multiple themes try and include examples from across that so they can really get an idea of um of what it is that you do in in in, in the fullest sense Aside from that, I'd say, yeah, it just needs to be kept really simple. So your name may be on the, you know, on the first page. You can include, if you want to, your CV, artist statement, a little a short biography, anything like that. It's not ne necessary in a, in a portfolio, but if someone's asking for a portfolio and nothing else, I probably would include those things mm -hmm. just in case. And then aside from that, I'd say one artwork per page and just list the name of the artwork, the medium, the year it was created. You don't have to write a short blurb on every artwork. You know, you can do if you think it's helpful, but realistically, only do it if it's going to add something, you know, mm -hmm. and that's the same with all of these things. And I guess that's what I'm getting at with this keep it simple message is only do things that are really adding something meaningful to what it is you're trying to communicate. And if they're not, then don't worry. So I'm really happy. And if the, if the artwork's you know, good and if the artwork speaks to me, I'm really happy having a portfolio that's 15 pages long, has no more than 100 words, and those 100 words are just titles, dates, and, and media. And I think that's more than enough. I think that's great advice because sometimes artists are overthinking before you know they show their work or because maybe 
they are scared of yeah. like certain perception of people looking at the work. But realistically, you know, as you said, keeping it like on a very essential level, mm -hmm. it's always the best because, you know, the work should almost speak for itself yeah. from one point of view. And you come as a curator and you also, you know, part of your job is also to ward what an artist, you know, maybe wanted to say with a work or maybe not. I mean, who knows? And um, so really, it shouldn't be sometimes the artists who, you know, explain, you know, the work. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no need for that in some situations, I think. Yeah, definitely. And sometimes there is a need for it, but I think it's just when, when you feel like you have to do it or you're doing any of these things because you feel like it should be done and it's not adding anything meaningful, then th I just don't, you know, there's no, mm. there's no need for it. So talking about uh, Rise Art, uh, you just um, finished the hanging of a new exhibition, which is not online. It's a physical one. Yeah, that's right. Yesterday we um, hung our, our, our maiden exhibition in our new space. So we've got a space in Berwick Street um, for the whole year of 2021. So this is an exhibition, it's a group show um, with I think about 10 artists represented by Rise Art. All the works are around the theme of kind of um, paradox and absurdity, which we thought was fitting given that we're opening a physical gallery after being online for 10 years at the one time when no one's allowed to go to physical galleries. So we're gonna open in due course when it's safe by appointment, um, but I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm really looking forward to being able to give our artists that opportunity to show their work in person because as the art world moves increasingly online, I do think that that's always an opportunity that's going to you know, excite artists and, 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 and make them happy. So I'm pleased to be able to do it for our artists. That's, that's a great news. So I'm going to link into the show notes great. all the information on this exhibition. So if you are in central London, you can go and see the show. And then um, I wanted also, you know, it's something that I ask every guest on the podcast and I wanted to reflect on and ask you what's your secret of the art business? Uh, my secret of the art business? I, I was thinking about this on my way here and I think the, my biggest secret is that the art world is really similar to the real world and that um, you know it's, it, it's, it seems to be very opaque a lot of the time and it seems to be very po-faced a lot of the time but if you're an emerging artist or a curator or you're someone who wants to collect art I think it's really important to try as hard as you can not to be intimidated and to be confident. And everyone is, for the most part, really friendly and everyone's here to help. Um, I think the art world, you know, people can become very jaded and it can seem like a place where no one likes anyone and it's all about what you know and who you know. But I think if you come to it with some kind of um, naivety or childlike confidence, I think, um, you know, it's a fantastic place and you can learn so much. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think... My secret of the art world is that it's actually not all that scary once you're inside it or not all that, you know, difficult to get into. I love your answer to this question uh, because I, I agree actually with what you're saying, with the philosophy behind it. And part of the reason why we have this podcast is actually to make the art world a bit more accessible to also provide tools for artists and art professional and also to um, make sure that it's a bit more fun and it's not perceived as is really a world, you know, behind closed doors because these doors are actually open now with all the changes that have come in this challenging year and everything is con going to continue to change but also it's opening and there's so many opportunities for artists nowadays to really you know, get their hands dirty and progress in their career. So I'm really, really happy that you said that. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I want to thank you so much for being today on this episode of the podcast. And to our listeners, I want to say thank you so much for listening to this podcast and being here, uh, giving us your time. And if you liked it, please rate it and follow it on Spotify, YouTube, and also the app, which is called the Art Fix YMX Radio app. Thank you so much for tuning in and see you at the next episode.